We're going to look at Genesis using the hermeneutic triad of history, literature, and theology. And we're going to focus on 1 to 11, which is called the primeval history. It's a primeval just means first age. And so we'll read through Genesis 1, verse 31, I'm um, sorry, verses 1 to 31. And it starts with, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate the water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from water above it. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land, and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants be plant bearing uh, seeds according to their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the sky from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the great, greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw it was good. And there was evening, there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and moves about in it according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and the water in the seas and the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kind, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and the creatures that move along the ground according to their kind. God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the, in the sea, birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created, created them. God blessed them and said, verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And so it was. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heaven and the earth were completed in all their vast array. 
by the seventh day God had finished the work he had been doing so on the seventh day he rested from all his work then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done so this is the Genesis account and and if you notice I, I didn't end in verse 31 I went further to chapter 2 verse um, and I'm not sure why they didn't just include that in chapter 1 which is where it, it belongs but here's the question when we read Genesis we have a ton of questions and we wanting to know if the Big Bang was true we want to know uh, you know how did we uh, how did we come to be we want to know DNA and all of that uh, scientific stuff but this is where we have to take a step back First of all, we have to ask, what does it mean to create or to exist? What would the ancient world, would, what would they have said, what it meant to create? And what do we think when we say create, what do we mean by create? And so, again, the hermeneutic triad helps us. We, when we read Genesis, we want to look at the history and look at the primeval history. So before we, we get into the history, let, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, cultural rivers. Uh, we, we all swim in it. Um, so for example, if I ask today, you know, when we talk about economics, or gender, or religion, or community, or individualism, we have a cultural understanding, we locate those terms within our cultural rivers. Uh, sometimes we float in it, and sometimes, or, or drown in it. <laughs> and sometimes we swim upstream. So like for example, gender is a, is a big thing today, gender equality, and how we treat men, how we treat women, and there's a whole lot of um, uh, our understanding of our, our um, uh, experience of and how we process and what we think is good about it, what we think is not good about it, what we think uh, we want to change about it. And those are the ways we, our culture sort of looks at these terms. But is it the same thing for different cultures across time? So when, for example, when Genesis was written, the ancient cultural rivers, they were swimming in uh, rivers that they, um, that, that included the Egyptian and Babylonian understanding of creation, what it meant to create, and they understood economics, gender, um, religion, uh, community very differently than, than our cultural rivers do. And so we want to really keep that in mind because when we don't, we impose our cultural rivers on them. And then we read Genesis 1 with that lens. Now we, well, um, we're going to hopefully do, God willing, apologetics sometime next year, God willing. And so we'll talk a lot more about this because on campus and really anywhere, evolution is a big question. And how do we make sense of evolution um, and Christianity? And, um, and so those, that's a relevant topic and certainly Genesis fits within that. But hopefully what we get today can still help you when you're on campus and people ask about Genesis. You can start to you know, give some kind of answer where we, we're reading Genesis within the lens of their cultural river. And when we actually do that, it, it opens up, it really blows our mind that wow, these, these guys really were swimming upstream. They weren't floating or drowning in their cultural, in their dominant cultural river. And so in the ancient world, creation meant going from chaos to order. That's how they, they saw creation. And, um, and so God communicated through Genesis, or communicates within their cultural river uh, to us today. And so going from order to chaos, when you look at that, um, the, the Hebrew word formless is tohu and empty is bohu. And so check out how that then works out when we read Genesis. In day one, the formless take on form. God separates light and dark. And then day four, he fills with sun, moon, and stars. So the empty becomes filled. So the formless take on form, the empty becomes filled. Day two, 
waters are separated above from below. And we'll look at the cosmology in just a minute. And then day five, birds in the air and then sea creatures below. And day three, water and land are separated. And day six, they're filled with animals and humans. So again, when we read Genesis 1, we, we miss a lot of these because we perhaps are reading it um, with, with our lens. We're asking questions that are relevant to our cultural rivers. But when we read it from the way it's actually designed to be read, immediately we start to see a pattern emerge. The empty gets filled with, within a form that used to be formless. So anything that goes from chaos to order is good. Anything that goes otherwise, uh, other way around, um, from order to chaos is bad. And so this is uh, the ancient cosmology. And uh, I don't know if this makes you struggle or what you, you know, how you process it. But we, again, that's the cultural river. We, have, we, we know our cosmology. Um, Hopefully we do, you know. Uh, we know that the, the sun is, well, you know, stationary and we are the ones going around the sun, unlike some time back when people thought the other way around. And, uh, and they had their cosmology. This is ancient cosmology. This is the Babylonian cosmology. It's the Egyptian cosmology. This is how they saw the, the cosmos. So there was a three-tiered layer with heaven, earth, and below earth. And when you see the word vault or firmament or dome in Genesis 1-6, what are they talking about? They, 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 this, they, they're looking at a separation between heavens and earth within a dome. And there's waters above and waters below. Well, why is there waters above the dome? Well, because that's how rain comes. So, you know, the rain, there must be water up there because that's how rain pours down. And that's their cosmology. And so we have to, we have to be able to, again, swim in their cultural river to see their cosmology and not impose our cosmology on them. And the Bible is not a scientific book. It's, it's, it's telling us a narrative, a story. Now, as we continue on with Genesis, hopefully it really starts to, uh, we start to appreciate their telling of creation and how God's word is um, clearly different from all the other cultural rivers that, that, that surrounded them at that time. But understanding this hopefully helps us to appreciate the Bible for what it is, instead of us imposing our own views on, on the text itself. Now within that, when we read Genesis 2 and says that God rested uh, on the seventh day, what, what, what in that cultural river would mean is that God is coming to take his residence among his people. He's coming home. Think of when we go, you know, after a long day's work, we go home and we kick up our feet and we rest. We're home. And that's the picture of God coming into His creation to rest with His creation, to live, to tabernacle with His creation. And that's how the ancient world would have read Genesis um, 1, the creation account. They would have seen it as a temple being formed, a created, a built, where God is coming to live with His creation. So creation itself is a cosmic temple. And so people have done research in the ancient Near East temple construction. Uh, they, they, they would build temples where, you know, for example, they'll have like the you know, representation of the sun and the moon and the stars, you know, like they'll probably paint the ceiling or something, you know, with those, those markers because that's the cosmos, you know, that they are, they are sort of um, they're creating, they, they're rebuilding uh, in their own way. And then um, the, 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 the temple requires an idol, so they'll bring the idol into the temple and that's their way of saying this is heaven and earth meeting and this is 
um, the, the cosmic temple, the representation of. No one thought of creation itself as being a temple and that's where Genesis is very subversive. It's saying, you know those things that you guys do? Because they, they're having conversations with their, their neighboring cultures. And so they're saying to the neighboring cultures, you know that stuff you guys do with your temples and you kind of have those cute little stars up there and you bring your little idol and guess what? Creation itself is a temple. And so this means we have to read Genesis 1 and 2 and compare it with other ancient creation accounts, not with modern technology. That, because they're not talking to us in that sense. It's written to them and certainly it's for us. But it's our job to go and swim in their cultural river or else we're going to miss the subversive points that they are actually making. And when we, when we finish up, I want you guys to tell me, is this not subversive? It's heavily subversive. Because the ancient um, uh, a creation account, um, when we look at, for example, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, Egyptian account, um, creation accounts, here's some of the things that they say. Uh, you have the Epic of Gilgamesh. Um, and there you have a Babylonian flood account. You have the Atrahasis epic. And these are some great, these are crazy stories that they talk, they tell. And from their perspective, humans are created to be slave laborers for the gods. That's their perspective. I don't know if you guys ever see or, or heard of a show called Stargate SG-1. It's one of the best shows ever made. <laughs> You know, it's uh, you're missing out. If you ever Google it, YouTube it, uh, you know, Stargate SG-1. It's a movie. It actually was a movie that came out in the I think it's the 80s or I forget when, 90 with Kurt with Kurt Russell, maybe 90s. I don't I don't remember. There's 10 seasons. SG-1. I don't know how many seasons. Maybe, but yeah, it has Richard Dean Anderson, MacGyver. <laughs> Classic. Awesome. But it's a, it's a very uh, Gnostic uh, philosophy uh, and there, uh, that's exactly what their premise of the show is that, um, you know, gods came and used humans as, um, uh, as, uh, as slave laborers and as, actually as sim symbiotes, they even use that word symbiotes, they, 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 they want to host us, uh, like, you know, use us as host bodies and they need us, they need us desperately because without us they cannot exist. And so we essentially become their slaves and, and then so on and so forth. And so that, that idea is not new. That idea is around. Um, and, you know, Enuma Elish, again, it's, uh, it's the creation is result of war between two gods, Marduk and Tiamat. And humankind was created to do the work the gods did not want to do. So that was how cultural rivers around um, that time thought about creation. Now compare with other creation accounts, what do we get is this backdrop of polytheistic culture. There are many gods, the gods are warring with each other and you know so on and so forth. And humans created to be God's workforce, slaves with their laborers. Now check out Genesis 1. Now read that Genesis 1 with that backdrop. And it is critiquing against creation stories of the mm -hmm. pagan world. It's saying, you know what? There is one God who is creator of all. So in Genesis, the, the, the sun and the moon and you know, the, the, the bodies and the heavenly bodies, they're not seen as gods. They're just seen as one of many that God has created. Mm -hmm. It's no different than mm -hmm. plants, animals, humans. God, one God, creator of all. And that is very clear. Um, message of Genesis. How many of us read Genesis with that and we, how many of us receive that message? We, we don't. We miss that. But that is a clear message that Genesis is giving is that there is one God, the creator of all. Period. Now we get caught up in, you know, is it evolution? Is it literal six, you know, six days? Whatever. And we miss the main point it's making is one God created us all. Um, check out this key, 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 key point. Humans are not workforce. Humans are God's image bearers. Do you understand the lofty vocation God is giving you? I mean, that's what Genesis is saying. 
we are we are reflecting God into the world and who is who is uh, the image bearer who is qualified to be the image bearer all of humanity this this is such a vital notion you know if if we took this true and 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 for real if we really took it seriously man we would have literally 99.9 percent of the problems of this world would be solved how do we treat other image bearers racism would be gone it wouldn't be any kind of dumb you know because we're all image bearers that is in, is in itself ex exceptionally subversive because first of all we're not god's workforce and in the ancient world the kings royalty would have been seen as representatives of gods and not all human being that's crazy are you nuts no ways because then how can i control you if you also are an image bearer i'm an image bearer what makes me better than you nothing we're all equal level level ground right but in the ancient world kings were the representatives of gods therefore they could do whatever they wanted to because they're kings and the the the, the minions we are the minions but then genesis saying no we're all God's image bearers and sadly we don't take that seriously it's deeply relational God wants to come and live with you God's not distant because that's and we'll look at this uh, when we look at Job sometimes the, the, there was a you know mixture of philosophies in ancient times one of which is that gods don't interfere with human affairs they don't even care as long as you do your your duty to them you know whatever rituals you're supposed to do and if things go bad for you it's because you messed up on your rituals and i, I can relate to this coming from a hindu background i certainly can you know the things you got to do and if you if you if you haven't done it in order in the right sequence then you you've displeased them but beyond that they don't care about you but this is god coming and resting with his creation deeply relational and then understand sabbath from this perspective it's like a new trend these days sabbath you know we got to all take sabbath i think we miss a lot when when we here's the key key point of sabbath our worth is not tied to our and and speaking to you know young ministers man i tell you this is such a vital lesson because if we don't get this lesson we're not we're not modeling this lesson and we're not teaching this lesson to those we serve our production is not tied to our, our value our worth why do you think this is important message that the bible gives where were the israelites egypt, egypt. what were they doing slaves. they were slaves how many bricks you made determine how valuable you were in fact not forget value you never valued because you were not but you the number of bricks you made meant that you didn't get beaten so you made x number of bricks you'd you'd pass you know you get a pass if you made less than that you get abuse you'd be beaten so this idea of rest do you think they rested in egypt they work 7 days a week they don't they don't even they work 8 days a week there's no rest and and your production kept you from either getting beaten or getting beaten and here god says rest because i rested our production is not tied our value is not tied to our production we are god's image bearers that is our value and i'll tell you personally i i mean i struggle and i'm still learning to accept this message because i want people approval i want my own worth to be tied to my production and and so you know I, i'm not trying to try to knock down rest at all that we should all rest but what good is resting taking a day off when we actually aren't really taking this message seriously i could rest a day i could take a day off but my value is still tied to my production am i really resting uh, and in fact that's what hebrews 4 when you read that you see rest is daily we rest in jesus and again not saying we shouldn't take time off work we should but also daily cultivate this message that my value is it's intrinsic to me being God's image bearers it's intrinsic it's not dependent on production and again as as young ministers 
we we learn this valuable lesson we'll pass it down we'll have a healthy community which is what this is all about mm -hmm. a healthy community rests a healthy community is intrinsically valuable we don't see each other as production machines that is healthy an unhealthy environment and you can think corporation you can think churches you can think community anything families where production is equal to value it's unhealthy and it will it will only result in unhealthiness so again, what an amazing message. So now when you read Genesis, keeping the cultural river in mind, and you realize what the other cultures would, other cultural currents were swirling around them, telling them, and now you read Genesis 1, you're like, wow, mm. this, is, this is a critique. This is, this is like, this is like um, Elijah and, and, the, and the prophets of Baal. This is mocking the value system of their cultural currents, and saying, this is, this, is, this, is what God, this is who God is. There's one God who creates all. He's made us to be his image bearers. We're part of the cosmic temple. And our value is not tied to production. Our value is intrinsic in God giving us value. His breath is in us. That is valuable. And is in each of us. So you can't treat someone else less than because they have the image of, they're just as much as an image of God as I am or you are. And so kings, you know, subjects, you know, there's no, there's no uh, separation, there's no distinction. And how much more true for us, like church leader, mi minions, no, uh, level ground at the foot of the cross. We're all the same. We're all image bearers. That's a seriously subversive message then and now, right? Mm -hmm. There's no CEO and, you know, managing director and manager and, and the laborers, you know. Mm -hmm. Or whatever, because that's all you know. The org chart. Every company has an org chart. This this organizational chart is flat. We're all image bearers. So you can imagine how you know encouraging it would have been, and also quite uh, controversial for different reasons. Genesis is controversial today for different reasons, but when we read it the way it was meant to be, hopefully um, it really helps us to see what God is telling us then to them and to us now and that's what i love about the bible it, it, it yes we have to uh, grasp the cultural river but it's not tied to a cultural river it's for all time this this is a timeless message